Awesome. Let's pray as we come before God's word and our kids head downstairs. Heavenly Father, you are glorious. You saw fit from before creation to work out a plan for our salvation that that involved your death on our behalf. You would take our place. You would pay our debts, but you wouldn't stay dead. You'd rise again. And we worship you for enacting this plan, a plan nobody saw coming, a glorious plan that would win not just our salvation, but actually our hearts, that we would fall in love with the God of the universe who died in our place. As we come before your word now, we ask that you would give us soft hearts to hear what it is that you want to say to your church today. In your name we pray, amen. I'm not sure if you've ever heard the name Peter Deneka before, but he was a Russian immigrant who fled to America in 1911. Uh, he was fleeing communist Russia, and a few years later, he came to faith, and he was powerfully used by God as an evangelist, both in Russia as well as in the States. Well, uh, Deneka tells a great story of his escape out of Russia. His parents had sacrificed everything in order to get him a ticket on a boat uh, that was headed to America. And, and he got on the boat with, with just nothing. Uh, he couldn't speak any English. Uh, he had no money. He just had a knapsack with a couple of clothes, uh, as well as some stale bread that his mom had shoved down inside of his nap, a knapsack that he was supposed to eat on the way. And as they crossed the Atlantic, Deneka would often look in on everyone else in the dining hall and wish that he could share just a little bit of the glorious food that everybody else was eating while he was literally starving. Some of the crew eventually took him in and offered him a portion of uh, the ra- their own rations if he would share their work. And he was glad to do this, even though uh, the crew was just eating gruel. But it was so much better than the moldy bread uh, that he had brought with him. But then something interesting happened. On the last day of his journey, after he'd been on the water for, for days and days, one of the sailors asked to see his ticket. And he showed it to him. And when he saw it, the sailor began laughing because written in bold near the bottom it read, the bearer of this ticket is entitled to three meals a day in the dining room. Deneka said, because I couldn't read what was written on the ticket, I didn't know what I was entitled to. Good morning and welcome to Fort George. I'm Dan. I'm one of the pastors here. It's Easter Sunday, and Jesus is risen. Amen? Yeah. There you go. It's also our interactive worship service today. Uh, And this is something that we do here at Fort George on the last Sunday of every month, and it uh, involves an opportunity for us to kind of connect with each other around worship. And so uh, if you're new to this, what we do is at this time, uh, everybody's going to turn around and you're going to take, make a group of about three or four people with the people sitting just in front of you or behind you. And then there's going to be a couple of questions that are going to go up on the screen, and you're going to have just two minutes to answer these questions. And so if everybody could turn around, uh, make a group uh, with three or four people, and uh, if you notice someone doesn't have a group, invite them into your group. But if your group gets too big, turns into six people, divide into two groups, all right? So you got two minutes to go over these questions. All right. Come on back together now. If you've been with us over the last few weeks, you know that we're in the middle of a series through Romans. Uh, We're in Romans 8 right now, which is all about how the Holy Spirit brings faith to life. So the idea is that being a Jesus follower doesn't mean knowing about Jesus. Being a Jesus follower means knowing Jesus experiencing him, living in the blessing of new life that we're entitled to because of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. 
This is the new way to be human. Well, today we're at the very end of Romans chapter 8, and actually we're in the climax of this whole section in Romans, this new way to be human section. And at the center of this climax lies the death and resurrection of Jesus. So this is an Easter text. And so if you've got a Bible, uh, go ahead and open that up to Romans chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 31. And as you're finding that, would you stand with me as we come before God's word? Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31. Hear now the word of the Lord. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and be seated. Paul asks several questions in this text. I want to unpack four of them today, and I'm not going to uh, uh, lay out what those questions are right now, but this is going to be our outline, these four questions, and you'll know them when you hear them. So uh, these, these questions point us to the new life that we're entitled to in Christ Jesus. Four questions. Here's the first question in verse 31. Paul says this, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Now, you got to remember the context here because this could sound uh, like Paul is a little bit out of touch with reality. Uh, I mean, who could ever be against us? Ha haven't you lived, Paul? I, I can think of lots of people. I mean, most of us have at least had times when people or situations were against us. You've been in a situation where you've had people against you? Maybe you're in that kind of situation right now. Maybe you've got a professor who is against you. You can't do anything right for him, no matter what it is. Or maybe you say, you know, if only you knew my spouse. They are antagonistic towards everything I do or say. Or maybe you've got inner opposition, right? So there's things that you're addicted to. Uh, they, they've got you ensnared. Or, or yours could be a physical opposition. You know, I'm sick. I, I'm going to die. My very body is against me. Maybe you've got a crazy family and every holiday is full of, you know, opposition. You just can't wait for the long weekend to be over. I won't ask for a show of hands there just in case some of your crazy family invited you to church this morning, all right? <laughs> Don't worry about that. Anyway, Paul could sound totally out of touch when he says, if God is for us, who could ever be against us? But you've got to remember that Paul is not saying that Christians are never going to experience opposition. Not saying that. In fact... Most of chapter 8, and if you've been with us, you know this, it's about enduring opposition. So Paul just finished saying, for the creation was subject to frustration. That's opposition. The whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to this present time. So there's opposition everywhere. And Paul's faced this himself. So he's beaten and imprisoned and hungry and shipwrecked. Eventually he's murdered. Not a ton of people in this room been murdered before. Anyway, that was a bit of a groaner. I apologize. <laughs> Paul knows all about suffering. And yet he says, if God is for us, who could ever be against us? What does that mean then? Well, it obviously doesn't mean that Christians aren't going to face difficulty. Rather, for Paul, it's all about perspective. It's about perspective. 
One of the conversations that I have on repeat with my boys happens around bedtime when one of them says, Dad, I'm scared. I got to say, if you ever get a chance to have kids, it's a brilliant thing because the only difference between kids and adults is that kids will admit that they're scared while adults pretend we aren't. All right? So fear in the basement usually involves the dark. But the dark is just what we don't know or what we aren't in control of. Right? The dark is an antagonistic boss who's in charge. We don't know what's going to come next. The dark is an addiction that can raise its head at any moment. You're not in control. The dark is a friend who stabs you in the back for no reason at all. You don't know what's coming or going. The dark is sickness. The dark is death the absence of control. And dark is a pile of clothes that casts a big shadow against the wall. The dark's anything we don't understand or can't control, and kids will admit that they're scared of the dark. So when I'm tucking my kids into bed uh, and this kind of context happens, then usually what I do is I start to talk about how big these monsters really are. And I'll say, you know, okay, there's, and we'll talk about what's going on. I say, okay, there's a mean spirit on your friends and, and they're turning their back on you. And so how big is that spirit in comparison to you? And, and you know, it's a consuming thing. It's an all-consuming thing. And, and what does it look like? Well, well it's big and, 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 and oppressive and it's not friendly. It's scary. It's huge. It's a big shadow that can eat you. If you've ever had friends turn their back on you, you know that this is the kind of thing that, that can take up all the room in your head. It can keep you up at night worrying. You ever been up at night worrying about something you couldn't control? That's a fear of the dark. So we talk about that. And then I'll say, those are big things. They're bigger than you, but they're not the biggest thing in this room. And then we talk about how big Jesus is in comparison to the monsters. You see, the monsters that oppose you are way bigger than you are. That's why you have no control over them. They will eat you for lunch. But Jesus created the entire universe. He, he holds it in his outstretched hand without weight. Every single molecule in the universe obeys his command. In comparison to Jesus, these monsters, the biggest monsters, are absolutely puny. He can squish them up, throw them in a pile, and eat them for breakfast. My kids like that. But actually, it's what David does in Psalm 23, the same picture. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you're close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. David says, death, you got sharp teeth. You're terrifying. You're, you're way bigger than I am. But you're nothing in comparison to the guy with the big stick beside me. One day he's going to eat you for breakfast. That's where David goes. So the answer to what scares you is not to spend your time worrying about it. The answer is to get on Jesus' side and let him deal with what wants to deal with you. Are you there this morning? Are you going to the one with the big stick? It's Paul's answer to the first question. If God is for you, who can be against you? It's perspective. No one worth mentioning. No one worth mentioning. How big are the problems in your life this morning? They're consuming your mind. In comparison to the one who holds the universe in his hands... Nothing worth mentioning. Second question, look at verse 32. Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything else? The question here is, if God has taken care of your biggest need by giving Jesus, won't he also take care of every other need? In your life? 
Hmm. Well, maybe. I, I mean, everybody's got needs. You got problems. Some of your problems aren't being fixed. Got problems that aren't being fixed this morning? I got problems that aren't being fixed. This is true. And so, yes, Jesus saved me, but I'm still in trouble. And it can be scary in the moments where my needs aren't being met. In fact, uh, Jesus' followers die. They go bankrupt. They face marriage issues. They have obnoxious friends. It's true. Jesus knows it's true. And yet he, he promises to provide all your needs. There's actually a parallel to this passage in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus says something awesome. He says this, don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. You know those stories where a king is really pleased and he says to his servant, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. You know those stories, right? And that's what's going on actually in this verse. And Jesus has got a big kingdom. This is awesome. This is an awesome promise. But there's something else here. Actually, this is such an offensively beautiful picture. I mean, Jesus calls us a bunch of little sheep. Not regular sized sheep. Little sheep. Right? Babies. This is Jesus saying, aw, you're cute. All right? Now, how does that hit you? That's offensive to everybody who's older than six years old. I mean, do you, do you remember the last time you got pinched on the cheeks? This is what Jesus says. I'm the shepherd from Death Valley. Compared to me, you and your problems are little sheep issues. I got this. As you try to figure out how offended you are, look at the promise. Jesus says, it gives me and my father great joy to give you anything you want. It's God's delight to do that. He loves to give us good gifts. And he knows, the shepherd knows that what his sheep actually want is his kingdom expanding in our lives. That's what Jesus' sheep actually want. That's what we actually want. What do you want? I mean, I can think of a ton of things, but what I actually want, Jesus says what I actually want is his kingdom expanding in my life. And he's the king. It's an easy thing to give. The question is, little sheep, Will you trust him? Will you trust that the one who gave you everything knows about the little sheep issues that concern you? And yet, will you trust that he will give you what he knows you really want? Isn't that kind of frustrating to be in that spot? But I want this, Jesus, the tink, the trinkets, the shiny things. Jesus says, I know what you really want. I built you to really want me. Will you trust him with that? That even the things that you think you want, he might not give because he knows you want other things. Third and fourth questions actually deal with how a Jesus followers can respond when we're faced with internal doubts and external hardship. Here's where actually, actually we get the Easter egg of this text. So look at verse 33. Who dares accuse uh, us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then can condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Here's the third question in the text. 
what happens to me when my sin rises up and condemns me? What happens to me when my sin rises up and condemns me? This is a crucial issue. It's incredibly important to deal with because mature Jesus followers can get stuck right here. Okay? Mature Jesus followers see our sin. We know God's a holy God. And so we wonder, mature Christians wonder, what happens when a holy God comes in contact with a sinner like, like me? What do I do then? Listen, if you came to Christ recently, it can feel like Jesus has liber liberated you from a massive slavery to sin. And he has. Jesus is at work. You have been freed. But there are sins under the gory sins that we commit that are more deceptive than the big ones. They're more deceptive than the ones that are visible to everybody and the ones that we see at first. And we often carry these little deceptive sins with us right into maturity. They don't just go away. Jesus actually uses them to sanctify us. I'm thinking about things like seeking the approval of people. Oh, how deceptive that is. Lusting for control. Hmm. Being selfish. These are actually the things that cause the gory sins in our lives. And, and it usually takes years for us even to notice these sins in ourselves. We can go along happily, merrily on our way, not even realizing that these deciduous sins are hiding under the surface. This just means it's common that after years of following Jesus, you'll find yourself suddenly becoming aware of a sin that's been present the whole time. Have you found yourself there? Just kind of coming to realization. And then it gets exposed to you and you say like, oh my goodness, like I, I can't believe I'm still this bad. I've been a Christian for five years or 50 years and I'm, I'm still like such a sinner. Maybe you're there right now said something hurtful. You slipped back into an old addiction. You found out that your micromanagement comes from doubting God. Maybe you just spend your time worrying about the unknown. Everything's gone along great and then all of a sudden your sin has raised its ugly head and, and you're devastated by the fact that you're not nearly as good as you thought you were. Anybody besides Kyle and I had that experience? Yeah. Paul asks, what happens when God's chosen are accused. Not falsely accused. What happens when you're actually guilty? What happens to Jesus' followers then? We've got to stand before a holy God wearing sin like that. What happens then? Paul's answer is that even though you're guilty, if you're a Jesus follower, no one can condemn you, not even God, because of Easter. Because Christ Jesus died for us, and more than that, was raised to life for us. That's why, and it's awesome. But Paul tells us why. Why the resurrection matters. Here it is. It's all about what Jesus is up to now. You see, things haven't gone back to normal since the resurrection in heaven. Uh, Jesus got a new job. He's our advocate now. Jesus is your lawyer. Paul says this, Jesus is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, 
pleading for us. That's a legal term. That's what a lawyer does. Now, guilty sheep, get your head around what this looks like. Jesus is standing before the Holy Father and your account is on the table, all right? So ultimately, one day, every one of us will stand before the Father and everything will get laid bare. But in another sense, we stand before the judge of the universe every day. So today, there you are. And if you are a Jesus follower, then Jesus is advocating for you. But what's Jesus saying to the Father, as they're talking about you, what's Jesus saying and what's he asking the Father for on your behalf? I give you a hint. It's not mercy. Think about it. If you get caught in a crime and you end up in court... And your plan is to admit that you did it and ask for mercy. Then guess what? You don't need a lawyer. All right? If you're going to say, I'm guilty, but I'm really, really sorry. Please don't give me what I deserve. Then you should not get a lawyer because you are, they are going to mess everything up. Right? You are going to do a way better job confessing your own sins and crying for mercy than a lawyer will ever do on your behalf. Right? I mean, I forget the show where there's that friendly judge who, who meets all those guys who are guilty. What's that guy called? You, somebody, surely it's not only me who's seen this. He's on YouTube. He's hilarious. He meets all these guys. They come in there. They're totally guilty. And then he lets them go. It's like every single time. It's, it's quite something. Because they cry out for mercy. If you cry out for mercy for yourself, you don't want a lawyer saying, this guy is guilty and he really wants some mercy. That ain't going to help you. You don't need a lawyer for that. Jesus isn't asking for mercy on your behalf. Jesus is your advocate. And an advocate's job is not to ask for mercy, but for the justice that's hidden. That's what an advocate does. And an advocate's job is to demand that you get what you're entitled to. And that's what the advocate Jesus does. He argues on your behalf. Justice. Here's his argument. Yes, Father, my client is guilty. He did it. He's a treasonous sinner, but I don't ask for mercy. I ask for justice. You see, the wages of sin is death. And I died in his place. My blood has paid every last cent of the debt that he owes. So I demand justice for my client. Father, you cannot condemn him because I was condemned for him. Father, you cannot forsake him because I was forsaken. If you exact punishment on this file, you will be charging his account twice. And that is not justice. So be just, just judge. Let Dan go free. Paul says, Jesus lives to intercede for you. This is what the resurrection entitles. You're not saved because of the resurrection. It's at the cross that Jesus made the infinite sacrifice. God lays down his life to pay for your sin. Every aspect of your salvation was complete on Good Friday. But the resurrection confirms that this is what happened. It's because of the resurrection that we can know Romans 8 verse 1 is true. Now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ Jesus, you can know that's true because of the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection proves that God was satisfied with the death of Jesus removing your guilt. It proves that. You see, Jesus didn't have to stay dead to keep paying for your sin. He paid it all, and your sin ran out, and Jesus got up. That's what happened at the resurrection. He suffered, and, and his suffering and his death were sufficient. And the resurrection declares that this is true. It is finished. Your debt really has been paid. Jesus has found justice to be served. Now, 
sometimes people will say, well, I know that God has forgiven me. I just can't forgive myself. <laughs> you don't know what I've done. It's, it's so bad. I just can't forgive myself. But come on, right? How big do you think you are, little sheep? You're not big. If you think differently about yourself than God does, you're wrong. You're wrong. So read the ticket. Jesus' death on your behalf entitles you to justice, not just mercy. Will you accept it? Will you accept that ticket today? Final question, what happens when bad things happen to me? Is God angry with me? Am I being, am I being punished? Does, does he not love me anymore when, when the bad things happen to me? Look at verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? I, I just love how, how clearly the NLT translation puts this. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we suffer? Don't we ask that? The implied answer is, of course not. God loved Jesus and Jesus suffered one of the big dangers people face when they come to Christ is thinking that now that we're saved, there are certain things that can't happen to us anymore, right? Like if we're faithful, then some bad things, the worst things won't happen to us. They don't happen to Christians anymore. But there's no promise of this in scripture. In fact, this side of heaven, there is nothing a Jesus follower can't suffer. Nothing you can't suffer. No trouble or calamity or persecution or hunger or destitution or danger or death. These things can happen to you. And if you've fallen into believing they can't, your faith is going to get rattled when they do. But look at how Paul, who, who knew all about suffering, answers the questions about God's love. Verse 37, he says this. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. In spite of all our suffering, Christ loved us. Notice the past tense there. Not Christ loves us. We're suffering right now. He loved us. Paul's thinking about the cross again. And he, here's what this means. Obviously, God loved Jesus. Jesus perfectly carried out the Father's will. And yet the Father let him suffer. And in his suffering, the father worked out his beautiful, kingdom-advancing, sin-redeeming, restorative plan. And he worked it all out for Jesus' good and the father's glory. Jesus went to the cross and won. He trusted that God would, would, be, uh, that God would call him to this and it would be for the joy set before him. That he endured the cross. Jesus trusted the Father and he was right. Jesus wins. He's not sorry he went to the cross. It's worked out awesome for Jesus. He's got the name above every other name. At his name every knee will bow. In heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. He won when he trusted the Father. Amen. Amen. Similarly, Paul says, despite all the things that you might be suffering, the Father really does love you. And this means that in, in the midst of everything that you can't understand, little sheep, you need to know that he's working out a redemptive plan for his glory and your good. All those things, all those sufferings, every aspect of suffering, not just persecution, but hunger, disease, sickness, death. Why would you let me do this, Jesus? All of these things, he's working out a redemptive plan for his glory and your good. 
little sheep. When you suffer, don't doubt that you're loved. Instead, live into the overwhelming victory that you're entitled to through Christ. Imaging Jesus, the suffering servant, is the new way to be human. This is how to win at life. When you look like Jesus, you win. Deneka didn't know what he was entitled to because he couldn't read his ticket. Little sheep, do you know what your ticket says? It's not just that you're saved. It's that in spite of your ongoing weakness, Jesus is advocating for you and you are entitled to justice, not just mercy from God. Mercy is unknown. Will he give it or not? But justice from a just judge is yours. That's the affirmation we've got. Jesus won it in your place. So truly, if you are a Jesus follower today, there is nothing that can ever separate you from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate you from the love of God that's revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you trust that God this Easter? Will you let what he's done for you win your heart and empower you to live into the new way of being human that he designed you for in the very beginning? He's got good plans for his glory and your good that are going to work out of what you're going through. We're going to spend some time praying for each other right now. So turn back around to that same group of people that you were with at the beginning and you've got Two minutes, it's not a chatting time. Just pray for each other. There's some stuff up on the screen there for you to go through. Go. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as your children and we come from all sorts of different places. There's all sorts of things in our lives that aren't comfortable for us. There's all sorts of unknowns. There's all sorts of monsters that threaten us. It's hard to see that there's something bigger in the room. So I pray right now for the power of your Holy Spirit, which is what Romans 8 is all about. That we can not just know about you, Jesus, but that we can actually know you. This is your job, Holy Spirit, to bring Jesus to life in our hearts. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be doing your work in our lives right now, causing us to wake up afresh to the reality of who you are. That we might see that you are huge. You've got a big stick. You comfort us and you protect us. And you advocate for us before the Father. You argue for justice. We're saved because of what you did. Come and bring this work to life in us, Holy Spirit. May we be a transformed people. May we live out the new way of being human. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.